right now. Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together on this fifth yom of the week to go over our second chapter of this book, Take Over America, or the Jesuits' plan to take over America, which was on a website that had been erased from the internet. I had found the link in a memory I shared on Facebook. And then when I was looking at it, <clears throat> found out that it was a broken link, used the Wayback Machine and found this book. So I took the whole thing, put it on the open office here, and then I'm making a PDF out of it for everyone. It shows clearly from 1814 to more modern times with the, the fall of the Twin Towers, how the Jesuits have used, have usurped our government and has slowly eroded our liberty. And to be perfectly honest, it would not be possible for them to do that without the willing participation of the people through our sin. So it really takes repentance before we can do anything else. But it helps to know what's going on before we can repent of what we've been doing wrong. <clears throat> and that's what this is all about. So without further ado, Chapter 2, President Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was elected to the presidency in the year 1828. His bravery and military skill in defeating the British in the War of 1812 are well known. He fought many battles in open combat, but now he was facing an entirely different enemy. This enemy claimed to be American just like him claimed to want the best for America just like him, and occupied high positions of responsibility just like him. The Jesuits were going to destroy America as determined by the sinister councils at Vienna, Verona, and Cherry. And it was during the presidency of Andrew Jackson that they began to apply their treachery in full force. These Jesuits moved among the American people and looked just like Americans. They were, in fact, American citizens, but their loyalty was to the little horn of Rome. Their purposes were those of the papacy. And again, I don't normally use that word because the calling someone Pope or Papa is the same as saying Father. And that was what we were specifically enjoined not to do. You call no man father on earth, not meaning you can't be respectful to your real father, but you don't call any other man like a Catholic priest, a father or a pope on earth, just like you don't call any man like a rabbi who, who wants to go around like a teacher as a rabbi. It's what we're told not to do. You can do it anyways, but then you're not walking in what he said. It is that simple. A lot of people like to make excuses, but there isn't one. It says, these people were traitors and a serious threat to the continued existence of the United States. A nation can survive its fools and even the ambitious, but it cannot survive treason from within. An enemy at the gates is less formidable, for he is known and carries his banners openly against the city. But the traitor moves among those within the gates freely. His sly whispers, rustling through all the alleys, heard in the very halls of government itself. For the traitor appears no traitor. He speaks in the accents familiar to his victims, and he wears their face in their garments and he appeals to the baseness that lies deep in the hearts of all men. He rots the soul of a nation. He works secretly and unknown the night to undermine the pillars of a city. He infects the body politic so that it can no longer resist. Marcus Cicero, speaking to Caesar, Crassus, Pompey, and the Roman Senate. That would be Julius Caesar, Crassus, and Pompey. That would Crassus would have been the general <clears throat> or the Roman uh, soldier who took an army into Parthia and got wiped out 
And then Pompey, I'm sure you're all familiar with. He was part of the triumvirate with Cesar and Marcus, or Ant Mark Antony, were the, or maybe it was Crassus. I have to double check on that. I'm sorry. But the three were try try ruling together at, at the permission and behest of the Senate before there was infighting and Caesar took over. Pompey, though, he was the one that actually first took over and came into the land of Yahuda mm -hmm. after uh, Astrobolus and Harkanus were having <clears throat> disagreements with one another. They were both brothers. Their mother was the, the wife of Alexander Janus. Mm -hmm. And when he died, he, he convinced her to allow the uh, Pharisees to have more power to keep control. So that was the beginnings of their influence at that time. And then when her sons came to power, Astrobolus and Harkanus, she gave the, the kahuna to Harkanus because he had no interest in ruling. And mm -hmm. Astrobolus, or no, I'm sorry. She gave it both to Harkanus, but Astrobolus usurped. And then um, Harkanus was content for a while. But it was the father of Herod, who became the king of Yahuda, who was friends with Harkanus, that first worked with the Arabians and then later with Rome to try to get Harkanus reseated as the high Kohen and king over the Yahudim. So, for a little bit of backup there, but be between their bickering and fighting, they went back and forth and then eventually invited Pompey to come settle the dispute, of which he did, put one on the throne, and then they demanded tribute from those they had, they had called friends before. <clears throat> There's more to the story, but that's not the point right now. Sorry. It says two of these traitors were John C. Colhorn and Nicholas Biddle. Andrew Jackson won the presidency in 1828 by a very wide margin. His vice president was John C. Colhorn of South Carolina. Colhorn realized that the love for freedom was very strong in the hearts of all Americans. He realized that slavery was rapidly beginning or being hemmed in because nearly all the territories purchased from Spain and France were made free. <clears throat> Without a continual expansion of slavery, it would eventually be defeated. In order to derail the current anti-slavery trends in America, Callhorn began a newspaper in Washington called the United States Telegraph. In this paper, he began to advocate the idea called states' rights. And if you remember in the Constitution, it says all rights are inherent in the people. It is even in the Arizona State Constitution that it, all rights are inherent in the people. <clears throat> the only rights a state has is what's delegated by the people to the state. And that's what's enumerated in each state constitution. Another key thing to think about, which most people are not aware of, is the rights, immunities, <clears throat> and privileges of the citizens of one state is the rights and citizens, rights, immunities, and privileges of the citizens of all states because we're all equal under the law. So if it says that you have the right to travel in the mm -hmm. Texas state constitution, that's a right every American possesses. When it says that you have a right to bear arms unequivocally, constitutional carry in the Arizona Constitution, or in other constitutions, that belongs to every constitution. And there's no stipulation that can be added to it because we already stated it shall not be infringed. When you have the other things that are being picked apart and messed with, like you have the right for people to do things in one state but not the other, all of that's garbage. And it's all just a it's a usurpation of our government, intentional divide and conquer to try to pull that house down because it's not in unison. 
but we don't have to stand for that. The people can form councils. We can form grand juries, learn about how our government's mm -hmm. supposed to work, investigate the criminals, and indict them for treason and the crimes that they're committing. We don't need to follow their statutes. We don't need to do with statutes whatsoever. The common law is beyond that, and it's greater. That is the supreme law of the land. It says the doctrine of states' rights would lead inevitably to the complete abolishment of the United States. It presumed that a state had an inherent right to do whatever it wanted. Under the principles of state rights, if a state wanted to secede from the Union, it could do so. This would eventually eliminate the United States, and that's the lowercase united, right? Callhorn took a festering sore and turned it into the reason for the southern states to secede from the Union. The festering sore was the high tariff placed on foreign imports, which made European goods more expensive. Since Europe brought large amounts of southern cotton, sorry, bought large amounts of southern cotton and other commodities, the tariff meant that southern merchants made less money for their exports. This tax helped northern manufacturers because now the southern merchant would buy more from him. Colhorn convinced the southern states that they were getting a very bad deal and that they had a right to leave the Union over this issue. The South, being an agricultural region, was easily convinced that a high tariff on foreign imports was injurious to them. He next undertook to explain to the South that these high duties were placed on specific articles and was done as special favor to protect local interests. Thus he said to the people of the South, you are being taxed to support northern manufacturers. And it was on this popular issue he planted his nullification flag. This new bastard democracy meant the right to destroy peaceably or by force, when ready, the Federal Union. John Smith die, the adder's den. And I don't know if I have this book on pdf but i'll look for it and i know i did pick it up i got a hard copy at the house so i believe oh actually i do think i have a pdf of this and he also uncovers two assassinations of presidents probably i don't know who all right sorry about that i've been mispronouncing that name the whole time but i was corrected so thank you brother but let's continue. It says, shortly after Calhoun started his paper, there was a meeting called to honor the memory of Thomas Jefferson. And 1828 was when both he and John Adams were poisoned. They both died on the 4th of July. <clears throat> At this meeting, Andrew Jackson was asked to speak. He arose and declared, our federal union, it must be preserved. After saying this, and by the way, it's because it was promoted by all of the founders, the whole council that made the Constitution, George Washington, John Adams, that to preserve the Union, it, it was all part of like, if you look at Hail Columbia, the original national anthem for America was called Hail Columbia. And it was about being united we stand, which is all scripture. Brothers united couldn't be overcome. And that's a theme from Menashe that you can see followed along uh, when they were out in the wilderness after they're taken into captivity. It mentions in 4th Ezra that some of them repented and left and went to go keep the Torah in a place where no man dwelt. That was the route taken and shown in 4th Ezra is also mentioned in Herodotus who was a Roman historian in the 4th century, 5th century BC. <clears throat> and he was writing about the path the Scythians took to leave the per media Persia area to go above the Black Sea where they, uh, in the lower steps of Russia, if you will, 
to grow and become a people and spread out to become the Scythian nation. That was a picture of Menashe at one point. Uh, there's a book. It's called The uh, the Names of Israel, if I remember correctly. And I will go ahead and get a copy of that put on the recording in the description later. I don't have a PDF of it that I'm aware of, but I bought a hard copy. Um, I'll find a link for it. In that book, it talks about a little bit of the archaeology, but it talks about the names that were known in the historical antiquity of Israel or Yisrael. And then the different names that were called after they were in dispersion. And then where you can find information about them. It's really well put together. But one of the things he mentions is a leader of Menashe from the royal Scythians, which would have been of the tribe of Yahuda from the royal line of Zara or Perez. Perez would have been part of the Parthian Empire that was ruling. And the Asarxid dynasty kept requesting more monarchs from the Scythians when they would uh, have a need. Because just like the curse of Dawid, where the sword would not leave his house, it carried on after they left the land. The Parthian uh, Empire, the monarchs were known after coming to power for wiping out their entire family so they wouldn't have any issues with assassination attempts. Everyone that was related to them, anyone that was in succession. So when the next one died, they'd have to pick another, someone that was related but no longer with them. And they usually stayed with the royal Scythians because they were related peoples. Ephraim was Parthia, the company of nations, a nation and a company of nations, right? It was That's why it's the Parthian Empire. They ruled over multiple nations, just like Rome, and they contended with them for quite a while. But then you had the Menashe, which was a great nation. They ruled over no one, but no one ruled over them. They were mercenaries for others, and they were spread from Eastern Europe to China and from Lower Russia to India. It's how vast they became. At one point, they ruled over the Middle East all the way from uh, Armenia down to Egypt for 28 years. But back on point, the uh, leader of them, of, the, of Menashe, who was of the tribe of Yahuda, took a bundle of arrows and gave it to each of his sons and said, try to break it. And the arrow is part of the emblems for Menashe. The bow and arrow was given to Yahusuf, and that part was given to Menashe specifically, which you see in our emblem with the eagle. You have the, the fruitful burrow, the olive branch, and the bundle of arrows. But he gave the arrows to his sons and said, try to break it. None of them could. And then he gave them all an individual arrow from the bundle, and he said, try to break it. And they all snapped them. And he was trying to show them that united, you're not able to be broken. But when they divide you up, you're easily conquered. And it was a lesson for our people through time. However, that's the very thing that they're trying to divide and conquer is the mantra of our country right now. And that's all Jesuitism. So I apologize for that segue, but there's a lot of meaning behind it. And there's it carries down for thousands of years literally not just hundreds for our country but for the people way before this time andrew jackson had said the federal union our federal union must or it must be preserved after saying this jackson sat down calhoun then arose and declared the union next to our liberties most dear May we all remember that it can only be preserved by respecting the rights of the states and distributing equally the benefits and burdens of the Union. <clears throat> Calhoun put the Union second to our liberties. The Union and the Constitution are what protect on paper. It, it says it said what protected our liberties, but it doesn't protect our liberties. It doesn't guarantee our liberties. It just what protect them on paper. We the people, if you look at the Constitution, I believe it's Article 3, Section 8, Clause 2. I have to look again, but it's on the enumerated powers of the Congress. And one of the things they can do is make laws respecting the calling of the militia to protect against sedition, repel invasion, and enforce 
the law. So it was always the people's job to enforce the, the Constitution. And it still is because these criminals aren't going to do it for us. <clears throat> but it says the Union and the Constitution are what protect on paper our liberties. If the Union were dissolved, the states would be at each other's throats, just like the countries of Europe down through history. The resources of the states would be constantly used up, always preparing for war with each other. This was the objective of Calhoun and the papacy, or Little Horn's office, from the beginning. Their goal was to destroy the United States. Calhoun used the tariff to create friction between the North and the South. And this is thesis antithesis and then synthesis they they or it's called problem reaction solution it's another mantra of the hegelian dialectic which is jesuitism congress could have easily changed the tariff so that was no reason for secession many spoke out against his underhanded methods daniel webster said Sir, the world will scarcely believe that this whole controversy and all the desperate means which its support requires has no other foundation than a difference of opinion between a majority of the people of South Carolina and the majority on one side and the vast majority of the people of the United States on the other. The world will not credit the fact. We who hear and see it can ourselves hardly yet believe it. And that's from the Adder's Den, page 25. <clears throat> Excuse me. Daniel Webster knew that the issue went far deeper than a tariff. Calhoun was the Jesuit plant being used to split America in two. John Quincy Adams in the House of Representatives declared, In opposition to the compromise of Mr. Clay, no victim is necessary. And yet you propose to bind us hand and foot, to pour out our blood upon the altar, to appease the unnatural discontent of the South, a discontent having deeper root than the tariff, and will continue when that is forgotten. Same page, same book. Adam was correct in his observation. The tariff died, but the smoldering embers of the division had split America in half. The blood of the Civil War can be traced back to the Jesuit, John C. Calhoun. As we watch Calhoun seek to rend America in two, let us remember the words of ex-Catholic priest Charles Chiniqui. And this is from his 50 years in the Church of Rome which I have in the description of the first video. It says, Rome saw at once that the very existence of the United States was a formidable menace to her own life. <clears throat> From the very beginning, she perfidiously sowed the germs of division and hatred between the two great sections of this country and succeeded in dividing South from North on the burning question of slavery. That division was her golden opportunity to crush one by the other and reign over the bloody ruins of both, a favored, long-standing policy. Charles Chiniqui, 50 Years in the Church of Rome, Chick Publications, page 291, <clears throat> emphasis supplied. Calhoun was not a loyal citizen of the United States. He worked to advance the Little Horn's agenda. He seemed to be an American, but was in reality, or but was really a Jesuit in the Little Horn's army in the effort to destroy America. Priest Phelan makes this statement: Why, if the government of the United States were at war with the Church, we would say tomorrow to hell with the government of the United States. And if the church and all the governments of the world were at war, we would say to hell with all the governments of the world. 
Why is it the little horn had such tremendous power? Why the little horn is the ruler of the world? All the emperors, all the kings, all the princes, all the presidents of the world are as these altar boys of mine. Priest Phelan, Western Watchman, June 27, 1912. John C. Colquhoun was one of the papal altar boys doing as he was told. Andrew Jackson, in his message to Congress in 1832, stated this, The right of the people of a single state to absolve themselves at will, and without the consent of the other states, from their most solemn obligations, and hazard the liberties and happiness of millions compromising this nation, cannot be acknowledged. Such authority is believed to be wholly repugnant, both to the principles upon which the general government is constituted, and the objects which it expressly formed to obtain. John Smith Die, The Adder's Den, page 25. Jackson knew that Calhoun's plot was devised to destroy the United States and its constitutional liberties, and this was unacceptable to him. <clears throat> Jackson was standing in the way of the Congresses of Vienna, Verona, and Cherie, and the Jesuits had to deal with him. Nicholas Biddle, another of their agents, carried out phase two of the Jesuit attack. Biddle was a brilliant financer, having graduated from the University of Pennsylvania at the age of 13. And that's significant. You might think that that's a wow moment, but most boys at that time were going to starting college at age 13. So it is significant that he was graduating that young. They didn't really like them going in until they were about 13, and they had to know at least English, Latin, and Greek fluently to study the scriptures because that's what they did in our country for 160 years worth of college education in places like Harvard. <clears throat> it says he was a master of the science of money. By the time Jackson came to the presidency in 1828, Biddle was in full control of the federal government's central bank. This was not the first time that a central bank had been established. Twice before, first under Robert Morris and then under Alexander Hamilton, had a central bank been tried, but in both cases it had failed because of fraudulent actions on the part of the bankers who were in control. After the War of 1812, a central bank was tried again, and it was in this third attempt that we find Mr. Biddle. Who is behind Nicholas Biddle and the attempt to have a central bank in the United States? The blunt reality is that the Rothschild banking dynasty in Europe was the dominant force, both financially and politically, in the formation of the Bank of the United States, capital U. G. Edward Griffin the Creature from Jekyll Island, American Opinion Publishing, page 331. And just for context there, after the Jesuit order was disbanded, there was a Jesuit named Adam Weishaupt, who was a German that was a professor or doctor of divinity, if you will, at, um, not Ingolstadt, uh, what was that? I can't remember. I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank right now. But he was a professor at a German college. It's Bavaria, there we go. I started with a B. So he was a college at Bavaria. And he went and founded the Illuminati during the disbanding and the dissolution of the Jesuits. The entire principle of the order, it was made so that if the Jesuit order was ever taken down again, they would have a secularized version that would be able to continue without any problems. And it was through this front group that he worked in collusion with the Rothschilds to be the financiers of that order, and they became the Vatican's banker. That's why they are as powerful as they are. 
They are the head witches of the Illuminati, if you will. But they're just a face for the Jesuit general. <clears throat> and it's a front group for the Jesuit order, which is the militant arm of the Catholic Church, which is Satan's pet organization in the world. Over the years since N. M. Rothschild, the Manchester textile manufacturer, had bought cotton from the southern states, the Rothschilds had developed heavy American commitments. Nathan had made loans to various states of the Union, had been for a time the official European banker for the U.S. government, and was pledged supporter of the Bank of the United States, Derek Wilson. Rothschild, the wealth and power of a dynasty, Charles Scribner's Sons, page 178. The Rothschilds long had a powerful influence in dictating American financial laws. The laws records show that they were in power in the old bank of the United States. Gustavus Meyer's History of the Great American Fortunes, Random House, page 556. The instigators behind Biddle in his efforts to establish the central bank were the Rothschilds, for whom was the Rothschild family working. Aware that the Rothschilds are an important Yahudi family, I looked them up in the Encyclopedia Judaic Judaica and discovered that they bear the title Guardians of the Vatican Treasury. The appointment of Rothschild gave the Black Papacy, the Black Papacy is the Jesuit general. He's really the one that rules from the shadows because he rules and dictates. But the thing is, that you have a Jesuit sitting on the uh, throne, if you will, at the Vatican right now. So whether he's not a the Black Little Horn, or the Jesuit general in disguise. That's been talked about, but there's nothing known for sure. What we do know is they have, as far as I'm aware, the <clears throat> three Jesuit generals, one active and two that are still alive, that are all functioning high levels in that organization. So they have a lot of things going on right now where they're, they're having them take over specific sections that do certain things because of how they're ramping up the deception and the lies and the crazy stuff they're putting out throughout the world. But they don't do anything without uh, a purpose. And the fact that there's three of them active and alive right now, while there's also a Jesuit sitting as the white little horn, is quite telling. That same little horn, just a few years ago in 2017, I believe, had a standing ovation in the balcony of the Capitol building in America, unlike any president, but just like a Caesar would, showing that they tried to conquer our country. Most people have no idea what that represents, but now you do. <clears throat> so it said that the appointment of Rothschild gave the black Jesuit general absolute financial privacy and secrecy. Who would ever search a family of Orthodox Yahudim for the key of the wealth of the Roman Catholic Church. F. Tupper Saucy, Rulers of Evil, Harper Collins, page 160, 161. And I'll also put a PDF of the Rulers of Evil in the description as well. The Rothschilds were Jesuits who used their Yahudi background as a facade to cover their sinister activities. And they're not just Jesuits, they're openly into witchcraft. If you, if you want anything about that information, you can look up John Todd. He has a series of videos that were put on for, there's a few of them, but I'll, I'll share the one that's on my channel. And he's he talks about how the Rothschilds were running things and the, in the, in the Illuminati, they looked to the Rothschilds as they would to Elohim. <clears throat> but the Rothschilds again, were just taking orders from the, the Jesuit general. 
So the Rothschilds were Jesuits who used their Yahudi background as a facade to cover their sinister activities. The Jesuits working through Rothschild and Biddle sought to gain control of the banking system of the United States. Andrew Jackson was not happy with the central bank. When Biddle sought to renew the bank's charter in 1832, President Jackson put his re-election bid on the line and vetoed Congress's attempt to renew the charter. He vetoed it for three reasons. The bank was becoming a monopoly, it was unconstitutional, and it was a grave danger to the country by having the bank heavily dominated by foreign interests, the Jesuits. Jackson felt that the very security of America was in danger from these foreign interests. He said, Is there no danger to our liberty and independence in a bank that is it, that in its nature has so little to bind it to our country? Is there not cause to tremble for the purity of our elections in shalom and for the independence of our country in war? And we lost our elections and and are <clears throat> have been used to fight Rome's war since after the Civil War when they took over. This is foretelling what was going to happen as well. Controlling our currency, receiving our public monies, and holding thousands of our citizens in dependence, it would be more formidable and dangerous than a naval and military power of the enemy. Herman E. Cross Documentary, History of Banking and Currency in the United States, Chelsea House, page 2627. Jackson's comments were nothing new. Others comprehended the power wielded by those who ran the bank. Mayor Rothschild said, Let me issue the control or and control the nation's money, and I care not who writes the laws. G. Edward Griffin, The Creature from Jekyll Island, American Opinion Publishing, page 218. This is the Jesuits Rothschild's golden rule. The one who has the gold makes the rules. Griffin then writes, the Rothschild dynasty had conquered the world more thoroughly, more cunningly, and much more lastingly than all the Caesars before and all the Hitlers after them. Same book, page 218. Thomas Jefferson has this to say about the central bank. A private central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army. And whenever you see these dots, it's a lispus. It means there's a space where they didn't quote a certain section of the text for whatever reason. Most, most of the time, because it's not relevant to the point. But it's always good to find these quotes and look at the full text for context. And I recommend you do that. To continue, it says, We must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. The Jesuits used Biddle and Rothschild to gain the upper hand in American banking because they knew they could then control the people and effectively rewrite the Constitution according to the Little Horns Law, which is municipal law or statutory admiralty law, the law of the sea. All these statutes that they're enforcing in our country is Babylonian slash Roman slash papal satanic law it is not the law of the land it is not the constitution and it's even been ruled in court that the statutes don't apply to a man so <clears throat> it, it's something that we have to learn more about and then actually start enforcing in mass because it's the people who, who can say not guilty and stop having these circus courts put people innocent men women in jail and steal our children and do other crimes against us Jackson was trying to stop them. Let us take a closer look at the central bank and see why it is so dangerous. Most people do not comprehend the central bank, the Federal Reserve Bank. Here is a very simplified scenario that pretty much explains one of the operations of the Federal Reserve. 
It is necessary to comprehend that the Federal Reserve Bank is not owned by the United States government, as many believe. The central bank, the Federal Reserve Bank, is a private bank owned by some of the richest and most powerful people in the world. This bank has nothing to do with the U.S. government other than the connection which allows the operation described below. The Federal Reserve Bank has a total government-enforced monopoly in money. Before we had the central bank, each individual bank competed with other banks. The customers, the consumers, got the best deal. Not anymore. We all know that today the United States government borrows money and operates under astronomical debt. <clears throat> Why is this? Common sense dictates that a policy of such enormous debt will sooner or later destroy the organization that practices it, because the interest on its debt must increase beyond its income, making payoff impossible. Now to our scenario. Here roughly is how the operation proceeds. <clears throat> Suppose the United States government wants to borrow a billion dollars. A government issues a bond, or the government rather, issues a bond for this amount, much as a water company does when it wants to raise money for a new pipeline or a new dam. The government delivers this bond for the billion dollars to the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve Bank takes the bond and writes an order to the Department of Printing and Engraving to print the billion dollars worth of bills. After about two weeks or so, when the bills are printed, the Department of Printing and Engraving ships the bills to the Federal Reserve Bank, which then writes a check for about $2,000 to pay for the printing of the billion dollars worth of bills. The Federal Reserve Bank then takes the billion dollars and lends the billion dollars to the United States government and the people of the country pay interest at an exorbitant rate each year on this money, which came out of nothing. The bank or the owners of the Federal Reserve Bank put up nothing for this money. So you see, that's massive fraud. We see, therefore, that when the United States government goes into debt, $1.00. <clears throat> A dollar plus the interest goes into the pockets of the owners of the Federal Reserve Bank. This is the largest, the most colossal theft ever per perpetrated in the history of mankind. And I would disagree only to say that the greatest one is what the papacy has been doing from its inception. Because it not only steals the money of Europe, but also the souls of men. The Federal Reserve Bank, however, is only following after the example it's given. <clears throat> and it is so slick, so subtle, and so obfuscated by propaganda from the news media that the victims are not even aware of what is happening. You can see why the Jesuits want to keep this operation secret. The Constitution of the United States gives to Congress the power to coin money. The supreme law of the land gives to Congress the limited power to coin money, not to delegate how it's done or to give it to someone else. If Congress coined its own money as the Constitution dictates, it would not have to pay the hundreds of billions of dollars of interest that it now pays each year to the bankers for the national debt, for money that came out of nothing. Money coined by Congress would be debt-free. Biddle responded to Jackson's refusing to allow him to reestablish the central bank by shrinking the nation's money supply. He did this by refusing to make loans. By so doing, he upended the economy and money disappeared. Unemployment ran high. Companies went bankrupt because they could not pay their loans. The nation 
went into a panic depression. Biddle felt he could force Jackson, force Jackson to keep the central bank. So confident was he that he publicly boasted that he had caused the economic woes in America. Due to his foolish bragging, others came out in defense of Jackson, and the central bank died. It died until its reestablishment in 1913, a little less than a hundred years later. It was reestablished then by the same people, Jesuits of Rome, for the same purpose of bringing America to her knees and planting the temporal power of the Little Horn in America. The Jesuits scheming for a central bank in America was temporarily stopped during Andrew Jackson's presidency. He had opposed Calhoun's states' rights doctrine, and he stopped Biddle's attempt to continue the central bank. When other things fail, the Jesuit oath declares that it is commendable to murder someone who stands in their way. <clears throat> the president had earned the undying hatred of monetary scientists, both in America and abroad. The Jesuits were furious. It is not surprising, therefore, that on January 30th, 1835, an assassination attempt was made against him. Miraculously, both pistols of the assailant misfired, and Jackson was spared by a quirk of fate, by the providence of Yahuwah Elohim. It was the first such attempt to be made against the life of a president of the United States. Now, it was the first overt open attempt like that. The others had been poisoned, as we mentioned before. And that's why I put openly right there. The would-be assassin was Richard Lawrence, who either was truly insane or who pretended to be insane to escape harsh punishment. And it's a sad tragedy, but Lawrence and the McLaurins and a few others are from the uh, Caledonia, originally from Scotland, but they went and fled south as they were persecuted for their belief in the laws of the altar and the renewed covenant. He's the son of Louis, or the, the sons of Lawrence were of the tribe of Louis originally. Others have been adopted in as they brought in people whose clans and families were lost in ripped apart in war but predominantly it was the sons of louis that hold that last name <clears throat> so seeing that the son of louis would try to kill a son of louis who andrew i'm sorry james madison he is also has the i hapla group i'm not sure about andrew jackson i'd have to look again but moving on it, it, it's sad that brother against brother we're all from the 12 tribes we're all related we're all from the same countries, and yet we still do evil to one another even thousands of years after the creator of the Shamayim and the earth came and told us how to live. It's a tragedy, but that's the whole reason why we're in the mess that we're in. So it says the would-be assassin was Richard Lawrence, who either was truly insane or who pretended to be insane to escape harsh punishment. At any rate, Lawrence was found not guilty due to insanity. Later, he boasted to friends that he had been in touch with powerful people in Europe who had promised to protect him from punishment should he be caught. And that's the same book, page 357. The Jesuit order was dead serious about taking over the United States. They infiltrated into government at the highest levels, and used their agents in controlling the American banking system. They infiltrated the government, they infiltrated the education, the different colleges throughout the country, and they infiltrated the different pulpits, the different denominational organizations. They founded them, they took them over, and then they perverted them to bring them through the ecumenical movement back to Rome. They literally function like the CIA before it was founded. And it, it, the CIA, excuse me, is a front group for them. 
says they would also use assassination when necessary to destroy any opposition to their plans. <clears throat> Andrew Jackson was almost assassinated by a Jesuit plant who bragged of powerful Europeans, the Jesuits, that would set him free in case he was caught. Other presidents came along who also incurred the undying wrath of Rome. <clears throat> Several have been assassinated, and a few escaped certain death. The next chapter, which discusses the presidents of or presidencies of William Henry Harrison, Zachary Taylor, and James Buchanan, will fill in the details. And that is the end of that one. As we go along, too, he'll mention a list of names for people that are known that they had killed. There's other writings and things, including the assassinations of the three first three presidents, Washington, Adams, and Jefferson by poison, that are not mentioned. But they're, they've are they been doing this from the beginning, killing off everyone that stands in their way as a policy par for the course. If they can't do it while they're in office, they get them after. Because Satan holds a grudge. He's vindictive. He doesn't forget, and he makes you pay. It's how he operates, and they are his studious followers in this world. <clears throat> you can see that perfect relation in, in what they did to the monarchs of Europe that threw them out of their countries when the Jesuits were disbanded. You had those revolutions that happened, the monarchs being killed, and then they were reinstituted. But they made them pay, and just like they made J Japan pay for what they did, and they make America pay for what we've done. And they make every nation pay for every time they don't do what they're told. It's satanic, but that tells you who they serve. So thank you all for your time. And Father willing, this is going to be beneficial and help us get right first with our maker and then right in our country. You have a wonderful day and week.